Castigar v. United States, Supreme Court, 1972. Justice Powell delivered the opinion of the court. This case presents the question whether the United States government may compel testimony from an unwilling witness who invokes the Fifth Amendment privilege against compulsory self-incrimination by conferring on the witness immunity from the use of the compelled testimony in subsequent criminal proceedings, as well as immunity from the use of the evidence derived from the testimony. Petitioners were subpoenaed to appear before a United States grand jury in the Central District of California on February 4, 1971. The government believed that petitioners were likely to assert their Fifth Amendment privilege. Prior to the scheduled appearances, the government applied to the district court for an order directing petitioners to answer questions and produce evidence before the grand jury under a grant of immunity conferred pursuant to 18 U.S.C. sections 6002 and 6003. Petitioners opposed issuance of the order, contending primarily that the scope of the immunity provided by the statute was not coextensive with the scope of the privilege against self-incrimination, and therefore was not sufficient to supplant the privilege and compel their testimony. The district court rejected this contention and ordered petitioners to appear before the grand jury and answer its questions under the grant of immunity. Petitioners appeared but refused to answer questions, asserting their privilege against compulsory self-incrimination. They were brought before the district court, and each persisted in his refusal to answer the grand jury's questions, notwithstanding the grant of immunity. The court found both in contempt and committed them to the custody of the attorney general until either they answered the grand jury's questions or the term of the grand jury expired. This court granted certiorari to resolve the important question whether testimony may be compelled by granting immunity from the use of compelled testimony and evidence derived therefrom use and derivative use immunity, or whether it is necessary to grant immunity from prosecution for offenses to which compelled testimony relates, transactional immunity. 1. The power of government to compel persons to testify in court or before grand juries and other governmental agencies is firmly established in the Anglo-American jurisprudence, but the power to compel testimony is not absolute. There are a number of exemptions from the testimonial duty, and the most important of which is the Fifth Amendment privilege against compulsory self-incrimination. Immunity statutes, which have historical deep roots in Anglo-American jurisprudence, are not incompatible with these values. Rather, they seek a rational accommodation between the imperatives of the privilege and the legitimate demands of government to compel citizens to testify. The existence of these statutes reflects the importance of testimony and the fact that many offenses are of such a character that the only persons capable of giving useful testimony are those implicated in the crime. Indeed, their origins were in the context of such offenses, and their primary use has been to investigate such offenses. Congress included immunity statutes in many of the regulatory measures adopted in the first half, first half of this century. Indeed, prior to the enactment of the statute under consideration in this case, there were in force over 50 federal immunity statutes. In addition, every state in the Union, as well as the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, has one or more of such statutes. The commentators, and this court on several occasions, have characterized immunity statutes as essential to the effective enforcement of various criminal statutes. 2. Petitioners contend, first, that the Fifth Amendment's privilege against compulsory self-incrimination deprives Congress of power to enact laws that compel self-incrimination, even if complete immunity from prosecution is granted prior to the compulsion of the incriminatory testimony. In other words, petitioners assert that no immunity statute, however drawn, can afford a lawful basis for compelling incriminatory testimony. We find no merit to this contention. 3. Petitioner's second contention is that the scope of immunity provided by the Federal Witness Immunity Statute, 18 U.S.C., Section 6002, is not coextensive with the scope of the Fifth Amendment privilege against compulsory self-incrimination, and therefore is not sufficient to supplant the privilege and compel testimony over a claim of the privilege. The statute provides that when a witness is compelled by district court, by district court order to testify over a claim of the privilege, the witness may not refuse to comply with the order on the basis of his privilege against self-incrimination, but no testimony or other information compelled under the order, or any information directly or indirectly derived from such testimony or other information, may be used against the witness in any criminal case except a prosecution for perjury, giving a false statement, or otherwise failing to comply with the order. 
The constitutional inquiry, rooted in logic and history, as well as in the directions of this court, is whether the immunity granted under this statute is coextensive with the scope of the privilege. If so, petitioners' refusals to answer based on the privilege were unjustified, and the judgments of contempt were proper, for the grant of immunity has removed the dangers against which the privilege protects. If, on the other hand, the immunity granted is not as comprehensive as the protection afforded by the privilege, petitioners were justified in refusing to answer, and the judgments of contempt must be vacated. Petitioners draw a distinction between statutes that provide transactional immunity and those that provide, as does the statute before us, immunity from use and derivative use. They contend that a statute must, at a minimum, grant full transactional immunity in order to be coextensive with the scope of the privilege. The statute's explicit prescription of the use in any criminal case of testimony or other information compelled under the order, or any information directly or indirectly derived from such testimony or other information, is consonant with the Fifth Amendment standards. We hold that such immunity from use and derivative use is coextensive with the scope of the privilege against self-incrimination, and therefore is sufficient to compel testimony over a claim of the privilege. While a grant of immunity must afford protection commensurate with that afforded by the privilege, it need not be broader. Transactional immunity, which accords full immunity from prosecution for the offense to which the compelled testimony relates, affords the witness considerably broader protection than does the Fifth Amendment privilege. The privilege has never been construed to mean that one who invokes it cannot subsequently be prosecuted. Its sole concern is to afford protection against being forced to give testimony leading to the infliction of penalties affixed to criminal acts. Immunity from the use of compelled testimony, as well as evidence derived directly and indirectly therefrom, affords this protection. It prohibits the prosecutorial authorities from using the compelled testimony in any respect, and it therefore ensures that the testimony cannot lead to the infliction of criminal penalties on the witness. Petitioners argue that use and derivative use immunity will not adequately protect a witness from various possible incriminating uses of the compelled testimony. For example, the prosecutor or other law enforcement officers may obtain leads, names of witnesses, or other information not otherwise available that might result in prosecution. It will be difficult and perhaps impossible, the argument goes, to identify by testimony or cross-examination the subtle ways in which the compelled testimony may disadvantage a witness, especially in the jurisdiction granting the immunity. This argument presupposes that the statute's prohibition will prove impossible to enforce. The statute provides a sweeping prescription of any use, direct or indirect, of the compelled testimony and of any information derived therefrom. Any person accorded this immunity and subsequently prosecuted is not dependent for the preservation of his rights upon the integrity and good faith of the prosecuting authorities. This burden of proof, which we reaffirm as appropriate, is not limited to a negation of taint. Rather, it imposes on the prosecution the affirmative duty to prove that the evidence it proposes to use is derived from a legitimate source wholly independent of the compelled testimony. This is very substantial protection commensurate with that resulting from invoking the privilege itself. The privilege assures that a citizen is not compelled to incriminate himself by his own testimony. It usually operates to allow a citizen to remain silent when asked a question requiring an incriminatory answer. This statute, which operates after a witness has given incriminatory testimony, affords the same protection by assuring that the compelled testimony can in no way lead to the infliction of criminal penalties. The statute, like the Fifth Amendment, grants neither pardon nor amnesty. Both the statute and the Fifth Amendment allow the government to prosecute using evidence from legitimate independent sources. There can be no justification in reason or policy for holding that the Constitution requires an amnesty grant where, acting pursuant to a statute and accompanying safeguards, Testimony is compelled in exchange for immunity from use in derivative use when no such amnesty is required, where the government, acting without colorable white, coerces a defendant into incriminating himself. We conclude that the immunity provided by 18 U.S.C. section 6002 leaves the witness and the prosecutorial authorities in substantially the same position as if the witness had claimed the Fifth Amendment privilege. 
The immunity, therefore, is coextensive with the privilege and suffices to supplant it.